You are listening to Anisua Works. The Mannequin's Boys 3. I lost count of how many days passed in that horrid house. Crazy as it may sound, you do get used to a smell if you linger around it long enough, no matter how terrible it may be. Slowly, the stench ceased to bother me, and I worried about the other things, like keeping time and finding a way out of there. As you can imagine, I had to eat at some point, and thank goodness those crazy people often had some fruit at home. After I threw up all nights from being force-fed once, the brothers let me eat whatever I asked for that they had. I found myself living on citrus and a few nuts for what I know must have been more than a week. Softer voice would keep me company often while raspy voice was at work. Rodents and roaches also grew to become a constant fixture in my stay there and I had to learn to blend them into the background. The positive side of being held in one spot against my will was that it allowed me to observe everything that went on around me. After being injected the first night, it had never happened again. I was smart enough to behave myself so that they had no reason to. Softer Voice was at home often, caring for their mum, cleaning up the house and making their dinners. Raspy Voice went out for long hours a day and often returned smelling even more of fish than he would when he left home in the mornings. Their mother seemed to be at the center of their world and aside paying me the occasional mind when I needed to use the bathroom or food, they would talk to the mannequin and tend to it. It became clearer that Raspy Voice was the dominant one. He would boss Softer Voice around and often called him derogatory names. I was lucky enough that they listened to me and would allow me to use the bathroom when I needed to. My toes went numb in the socks I wore, but I would rather have my toes rigid and falling off than directly in inches of dust and filth. I thought day and night about how to get out of that place, but after one of the creepiest moments of my stay there, I became a thousand times more motivated to escape. I was sitting in my usual spot upstairs one afternoon when I heard the door open. I was startled to hear raspy voice downstairs because usually he stayed out longer. I heard him call out for his mother and brother. I strained to hear as he told them he had found it, that he had found the perfect one. My heart began to race. I felt sick as the possibilities of what he might mean went through my mind. I hoped they had not snatched another girl from her home. I listened to the familiar sound of the brothers walking up the stairs, frozen with fear and uncertainty. My brain struggled to make sense of the white bulb that came through the door, followed by more bulk and the brothers shoving from the back. The mask finally came through the door and I saw that it was a dress bag. I watched with wide eyes as they held up the bag in front of me, with large grins on their faces. As raspy voice unzipped the bag, it revealed a snow white wedding dress. I think I blacked out because I regained consciousness to find the brothers tapping me on the cheeks in a bit to rouse me. I preferred being unconscious because the apparent reason why they would get me a wedding dress was a nightmare I did not want to live. Should I make her put it on? Softer voice asked. Of course not, stupid. The groom is not supposed to see the bride before the wedding day. You have four days to make her look amazing. Don't mess this up. Raspy voice said firmly, his finger inches away from his brother's face. I watched softer voice retreat farther into his timid self as his brother stormed off towards the living room. I was gagged and so was unable to speak at any time. I could only grunt in agreement or the opposite. When I needed to go to the bathroom, I would draw attention to myself by pulling on the chains and banging against the chair. Softer voice would point to the bathroom and I would not. I tugged at the chains to get softer voice's attention. He looked at me and pointed to the washroom. I shook my head. His brows creased in confusion. I shook my head and tried to push the gag out of my mouth. I was desperate for him to take it out so that I could speak with him. No, 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 he said. He would kill me. I can't do that. Just sit still, he said pulling the chains tighter around my ankles. Before he walked out, softer voice stopped in the doorway, put his finger to his lip, and urged me to keep quiet. I started to cry softly. 
I felt so hopeless, and my attempt at getting through to whatever humanity's softer voice may have had, had just been dashed. I looked around me once more, desperate to find something I had not seen the previous million times. It was futile. The walls were still draped with clothes laden with dust. I could not tell what time of day it was, and I was so sick of sitting in a chair. I started to cry again until something caught my attention. I heard what sounded like rain outside. The drops were hitting the ceiling at irregular intervals, and in a matter of minutes, it started to pour. It was so windy, and the sound of the raindrops crashing down on the ceiling was deafening. I wondered what time of day it was, and I ached at the thought of my mother wondering where I might be in that kind of rain. I could actually hear the wind howl as it went by, and I was very concerned for my safety. I had no idea what kind of building I was in, or whether I had other floors above me. If the building were to collapse, there would be no telling what was coming down on me. I started to feel cold, and as I hunkered down in a bit to keep warm, softer voice came into the room. He had a blanket in hand and threw it over me. I was so grateful because it made a huge difference for me and was not nearly as dirty as I thought it would be. For what felt like hours it rained. I could see the flashes of lightning coming in through the cracks in the drapes. When it stopped raining, I was able to clank softer voice back into the room where I sat. He stood in the doorway and repeated to me why he could not take off my gag. I shook my head and gestured towards the washroom. Softer voice sighed as he walked up to and chained me from the chair. He led me out into the washroom and shut the door behind him. I knew I had about a solid three minutes alone and so I wasted no time peeing. Then I got to looking around the washroom for a way out. My heart sunk to find that most things were the same, but just as I started to give up, a flash of light caught my eye. I gasped. The light was coming through a crack in a wall on top of the water closet. My heart pounded at an unhealthy rate from the adrenaline coursing through my veins. I grappled with the choice of checking it out because softer voice could come in if I wasted time and I did not want him to discover the crack. I dared to check it out and climbed onto the water closet. I could see very little through the one inch crack, lots of trees and a light far off. I was startled when softer voice knocked on the door asking me to come out. I quickly dismounted and obeyed. He bound me back into place and for the first time since I got there, I felt a sense of hope. That little crack was of tremendous value to me. If nothing at all, I had caught a glimpse of what was going on outside where I was. The next day, softer voice came into the room where I sat with a tape measure. My eyeballs followed him around as he took random measurements of me. He then combed my hair while humming a tune I knew was familiar but could not place. I had goosebumps the whole time it went on. It was the weirdest experience ever. I told myself that I had to make it out that night. I was grateful I would have the cover of night, but I was extremely nervous about not knowing what exactly my surroundings were. I knew there were trees about and a light shone off in the distance, but I had no way of telling how far off the light was and if I would find help there. Whenever I was alone, I would tug at the straps of my wrists while making as little noise as possible. The leather was soft and of poor quality, so after weeks of tugging at it whenever I could, it was very close to breaking. It seemed like I had everything I needed to escape, everything except a concrete plan and courage. During that evening, I sat stiller than ever before. I wanted to do nothing at all to upset them or give them a clue as to what my plans were. At dinner, I cringed as I listened to them talking about what meals to cook in celebration of the wedding. Right across the table from me was the mannequin, dirty as ever, seated with its hand in a bowl of cold soup. I silently prayed for everything to go as planned for me because I knew that a botched escape plan could be the end of my life. After dinner, Raspy voice wheeled me back upstairs himself in an act of what he called husbandly duties. I could feel his breath waft down towards me every time he exhaled and goosebumps would follow for me. As he swirled me around and bound me back in place, my heart pounded for an all new reason.
The thin straps were noticeable if one looked hard enough, but thankfully, he kept his eyes on mine the whole time and missed it. I sat frozen in anxiety for at least two hours as I listened to them living downstairs. I recognized familiar sounds like the dishes being done and the television channels getting flipped through. Finally, about an hour later, there was a trademark silence I had been waiting for. I could hear no one about except the mice, and the television was off. Every time I tried to move, I could not. I was mortified of making a wrong move. The house was ghostly quiet, and the least sound I made could travel for a good distance in the silence of the night. I had to be cautious. It took everything in me to start yanking at the straps. When the first one broke, I knew there was no turning back. I untied my other hand and as quietly as I could slipped out of the chains. Tears spontaneously started streaming down my face from what I can only guess was the sheer terror I felt. I tiptoed my sobbing self across the room and into the bathroom. I could barely see anything in the dark room and I'm pretty sure I stepped on a mouse as I went along yet kept on pushing. I made it to the bathroom and climbed on top of the toilet seat. On my tippy toes, I could see through the crack. It was dark all right, and the light was even farther away than I thought. I pushed my fingers through the crack and pushed with all the might I had. I was surprised to see almost half of the bathroom wall crumble to the floor. A foul smell of mold and rotten wood blew over me as the damp material broke away and fell to the ground. The wood was so rotten, it gave no resistance to my push and fell to the ground in almost a hush. The plan was going better than I expected and now I had a hole at least 8 feet across to crawl out of. Seeing I was about 10 feet off the ground, I shook with so many emotions at the same time. As I tossed myself out of the opening in the wall, I protected my head with my hands and prayed for the best. I landed on my back in the rotten wood and grass. I let out a dry scream as I felt a sharp pain coursing through my side. I knew something was wrong from the way I felt, but I would have been damned to allow those lunatics find me. I crawled to my knees and then to my feet in the most agonizing pain as I leaned against a tree stump for support. I could feel how dilated my pupils were from trying to see in the dark. The ground was so wet from the rain, and I was grateful the grass provided cushioning for my feet. I had been living on much fewer calories than my body needed, and the physical exertion was draining me fast. It took everything in me to get one foot in front of the other while running. I took off towards the light, glancing back only once. There was no one after me, and the house of horror was well off in the back. That did not get to my head though and I kept racing for the light in the distance. I was not going to take any chances by letting my guard down. There were tens of other things I could have worried about, like bugs, snakes and critters, but I was so focused on escape that I could have darted past a leprechaun on a rainbow and missed it. For at least 10 minutes I ran. My side was killing me at that point and it hurt to breathe, but I knew I could not stop. The light was still on in the distance, but I was closer to it now. I kept running despite knowing I was cutting it close. I could feel my body start to completely give up. I thought I should probably stop and rest. And it was at that instant I felt myself slamming to something hard. And then everything went black. To be continued. If you like this story, click the subscribe button for more content like this. If you like the story, do click the like button. Also, you can share this story 